now Ryan Crane will introduce our speaker this morning. Good morning, friends. Uh, so we have Ben Page as our uh, guest speaker this morning. Um, he is the director of Des Moines Parks and Rec, uh, and an endorsement from Mike Simonson means a lot. Um, he has uh, led the department for almost 14 years. Um, he leads a $15 million uh, operating budget um, and a, a large capital improvement plan, 60 full-time and 300 part-time and seasonal employees, um, multiple contracts, 77 parks, 400 acres of uh, open space and land, 69 miles of paved trails. Uh, the list goes on. He was awarded uh, the 20 in 2023 here, just, just several months ago, with the National Recreation and Parks Association's gold medal, which is given out to only four uh, parks and rec programs in the country annually. So very distinguished. Uh, prior to his appointment as director, um, he was the assistant director in Des Moines for about six years um, and then was the director of Parks and Rec in Manchester, Iowa. Anybody in Manchester? Uh, for six years. Um, he has been a member of the National Recreation Park Association and the Iowa Park Recreation Association since 2001. Um, and for IPRA, has served uh, a number of roles, including president. Um, he received the highest honor possible from the Iowa Parks and Recreation Association, the Slatter True Blood Professional Award in 2015. Um, he was also recognized uh, by our own business record in 2013 as a 40 under 40. So everybody, please help me welcome Ben Page. Let me let me first thank you for being here. Actually, we've been looking forward to this since the day Jonathan Wilson called me on the phone and said, hey, would you come? And I knew two things like I was telling our group over here. And I worked with Jonathan on the zoo board for quite a long time. I knew I wouldn't say no to Jonathan. And even if I did, he's a skilled attorney, so he had out debate me and I'd still be here. So here we are. Um, but then all the great friendly faces, I see Chelsea Lepley and Mike Simonson both were on the Parks and Recreation Board during the time of their careers here. Matt McCoy, I get to work with in government relations and all the things that he does for our, our park system and grants he gives us. And of course, Ryan, he wears lots of hats, as you all know. He's also involved with the Polk County Conservation Board. So lots of great people here. I'm excited to be here. So thank you. I'm going to tell you a quick story about the Des Moines Parks and Recreation Department. It's going to be a little bit about how we're funded the public places we manage, the programs we manage. And then last, if we have some time, I'll go through some really cool projects you'll see come through this year. So our mission is helping Des Moines live well, play hard, and protect the earth. Real simple by design, making sure we try to hit a little bit of everything in our community. All right, so just quickly, this is kind of like when I started in, in 2007 as the assistant director, we had 147 full-time employees. We had almost 60 permanent part-time and close to 500 seasonals. Today we have 68 full-time employees, 37 permanent part-time, and 320 seasons, seasonals, yet we won all these national awards. So you're going to hear a story of how we hit rock bottom, and then we became what we, we like to call ourselves in our department national champions here in about 15 years. It's quite a story, and it takes place because of only volunteers and great support from this community. When I talk about it, everybody wants to know, where does the money come in, and, and where's the value at when I pay my property taxes? So we are funded through property tax dollars. I always like to remind people when we speak that there are a lot of folks that pull off every dollar. So every dollar that comes into the Polk County property tax collection, you can see the city gets 39 cents. And if I zoom you in a little closer, that if, at that general fund, that's just the property tax dollars. That's not your road use tax dollars. And that's not your fee you pay for garbage or sanitation or other things. That's about $220 million. And you can see Parks and Recreation falls in there close to $16.5 million. So if I zoom you in further, just to Parks and Recreation, you can see that we uh, we have a lot, we have a few other sources. It's as close to about seventeen million dollars to operate the department each uh, each year. We break it down into service lines. You can see rec centers, trails, aquatics, the parks, all those things that we provide, and we bring in about four point two million. And if you're looking at bottom lines, it's like that for all Parks and Recreation departments. If we were trying to just break even, there wouldn't be a single person in this city that could afford all of our services, or at least to justify it. And one of the things you'll hear today is, about five years ago, we had a pricing strategy review with our team. We wanted to find a way to engage more use of the parks, more use of the pools, and so forth. More and more and more is what we were trying to get. And it was real simple, was let's knock our fee down. And it took a lot of coordination between our city council and a lot of buy-in. And you'll see as we get through this presentation that not only did that strategy worked, it worked really well. The other pot of money, so we have the two pots of money. We have operations and we have project money. That's a different pot of money called the capital improvement program. And just like you might buy a house and do a 20 or 30 year mortgage, 
we pay 20 year bonds off. So anything we build should last a minimum of 20 years. So this pays for the upkeep of the park system, cemeteries, parks, recreation, trails. So yes, we do maintain cemeteries. That's always something that people don't have any idea. So I've given this enough times, this public speaking series about the money and nobody loves hearing public financing 101 with bar, with bar charts and pie graphs. So this has actually been more helpful to me in the past is how, what is your real value? So I know you can't read that fine print very easily, but what that says is the average keyword assessed value of a home in Des Moines is $170,000. If I back out, like I just did with you, the money that we spend on parks and recreation, just the tax dollars that goes at, it's $169 a year for that house that pays the $170,000 house. So people like to understand that. So what do you spend maybe last month for $170 is what I always ask. Did you take your family of four to the movie and you dropped $100 right there for maybe one movie, right, with a family of four? Did you get 77 parks? Did you get 61 playgrounds? Did you get all this that's open year-round? Most of this is all free. So sometimes that usually helps. But the next slide, I always get somebody to say, that, well, that's great, but I don't play golf. So does anybody even use your golf courses? Well, or yeah, or any other category that you want to talk about? Well, yeah, we had 120 3,000 rounds of golf last year. And so when we start showing the numbers and telling the story, people start to click, oh, that is a really good good investment of the community. And I always pause right here. I think about no matter where you've lived in your careers, in your lives, think about your community. Did you move there because it had the best of everything, but not a parks department? Would you want to stay there? What helps retain and recruit employees to our downtown? What keeps young families in this community? It's the Parks and Recreation Services. And I've seen it firsthand. So now into the public places here. So uh, you'll see some cool pictures, but I'll, we, I'll be brief because we have a lot of slides. So we have a lot of water facilities. And so if you look at a per capita of 1,000 residents, we lead the nation in a lot of water recreation. Spray grounds is our team. We call that it's like a playground. Hit the button, they take off. We lead the nation in free spray grounds, 14 per 1,000 residents. You're going to hear equity too. And I think that's really important to everybody right now is when you think about city government, you think about fair share of those resources being dispersed across our city. I think you've all heard this is not a wealthy community when you look at it from top to bottom. I was looking at your scholarship program. You get to see that there's a lot of folks that can need a little extra help. Our pools are very, very affordable, and we'll get into that. But right now, we purposely charge $3 to get into our pools. I'll give you an example. If you go to Ankeny, they have two great public pools, nothing against them. They're just a different demographic. They're 9 and $11 to get into their pools. We started doing that and our numbers went through the roof to get more people to come in to use these schools. And they're only open 80 some days a year. So why not make sure that the investment the taxpayer already has in these facilities, we keep them open. Next, please. We also operate the Duke Skating Rink downtown. It's recently transitioned over to us for uh, Operation Downtown and the Greater Des Moines Partnership used to run this facility. Uh, we try to do a lot of different events there. So if you haven't seen it and you haven't used it in a long time, please come out. It's, it's got a limited window, right, that's getting warm out. So we can keep the ice till about 50 degrees. At least this, this week's been a little challenging to us, but we try to come out and do different events all the time. Even accessibility, you have adaptive skate, we do senior skate days. We have a lot of fun out there, so come on down. Cemeteries, this is quite a story here. We have eight cemeteries, makes us the largest cemetery manager in the Midwest. And one of the th one of the challenges we've seen over the time is, you know, what do you do? How do you engage cemeteries beyond their normal purposes to have an internment or a family to come and visit somebody's loved ones, right? We have hundreds and hundreds of acres of cemeteries that we're paying every every week to mow, maintain, and to remove snow. Why not find a way to make them more program-based to make people have access to them? So next slide. So during the pandemic, uh, a few years ago, and we all know what happened during the pandemic, there's only a few businesses that didn't shut down, and Parks and Recreation was one. We saw huge increases in the use of our parks and our trails. Well, one thing we saw right away was like one of the first weeks I went out to Gray's Lake, and you know, one of the challenges our city council wanted was to make sure we could get people spread out. Well, everybody was going to Gray's Lake. We were shoulder to shoulder, and it was that first week where we all didn't know enough about COVID, but we knew that, that wasn't a good thing. So we quickly put our minds together and we said, hey, why, why don't we open up the cemeteries and how do we do that? Well, we got together with a group of volunteers and we create QR codes. They're still there today and now they're up to over 70 QR codes and each one of them is anywhere from 90 seconds to two minutes long. It's why that person in turn there is important to our city's history, our state's history or beyond. So if you're looking for a nice day to get out for a walk, it's been awesome to see this program take off. In fact, we were copied across the nation. We were the first to do it. We were picked up in the New York Post and all the different outlets across the nation, and it worked. 
It worked so well that we've been working with Mike Simonson for years trying to raise money to preserve this history. What you may not know about cities and cemeteries is it's kind of like a subdivision. We sell you your plot to build in. Well, in this case, we sell you a plot to have your interment on, and you're responsible for that monument, right? Well, you get a cemetery that's from the 1840s. A lot of those families either don't live in Des Moines anymore or don't even have a family left. And so those those monuments start to lean, they start to fall, and there's nobody responsible for them. In our world, we touch one, we have to touch them all and fix them all in the city because we have to be equitable. We can't just say we choose to fix these three or four. So Mike and a group came together to help us to raise some money. So next slide. Oh, sorry. I'm a little quick there. It's going to. So I'm, I, I must have missed a slide here. But anyways, on that story, it came together. We started fixing and cleaning with, with a lot of volunteers. Today, we have 90% of the cemetery all cleaned. For about 10 years, I would turn in budget documents. If you've been through Woodland Cemetery, it has brick roads, and they need repaired, and it's really cool and historic. We just couldn't get that to be a top priority. I would joke, and I can say this because Matt's here, I would joke with the elected leaders, it's because there are no voters there, right? So Mike, be listening if you get elected. So and if they are, they're not legal voters, right? So so finally, with all the great work of all the people actually walking that led to the volunteering, it led to council putting money in. So just this last summer, we finished up over $2 million in road work there. And on next council agenda next Monday is the retaining walls and some sewer lines and water lines. So that cemetery is going to be 100% restored here by next summer. All right. Rec centers, another thing we try to do is to make sure that that pricing point, nobody else in the nation is following this pricing strategy we're doing. We own two rec centers. You're going to hear about a third we're building at the end. I draw your attention to the bottom. Who else lets people in their rec centers for free? We charge a dollar once you turn 18, and when you become age 55, you're back in for free. It's by design. We, we've learned a lot of things that we can either let the kids come in and have a safe opportunity to learn things and be good and be good members of the community, or we can hire more police officers in these neighborhoods, right? And it's better to hire more parks and recreation staff to get these kids on the right path. Our day starts out in the morning with low-income seniors. There's a lot of low-income need in our community. We partner with the county. They feed them a nice, healthy meal. We then go into programming that morning with them all the way to about noon, do things like, you know, pickleball. We train for actually 5Ks. The seniors are telling us, don't, don't put us in that box where we're not able to do all these active things anymore. And we, you, we also do senior talent shows. So then around noon, the business community comes in and they get their workout. And then about 3.30, we get inundated with kids over 100. And most recently, we partnered with our police department because there's a, there's a lot of going on with the police in this world with a narrative about kids should maybe fear the police, and we're trying to break that barrier down. So our police come in, and they do character counts. They also do dodgeball. What kid doesn't want to throw a dodgeball at the police officer, right? It's our most popular thing. If you want to come down and see that, it's awesome. All right. We have three dog parks. I think everybody uh, loves having these dogs, these four-legged friends that walk around. And one of the things we've learned is that these are really more for the humans. The humans go there and they they get more out of it than the dogs for the exercise. It's the social piece, right? They're all there hanging out. Uh, again, $20 gets you access to all three dog parks. Uh, great story here, greenhouse. So about 15 years ago, the city came together with a proposal from our office to beautify the city. You've all driven Fleur Drive and seen those medians. You've seen our park signs that have flowers around them. You've seen downtown with all the flowers. You maybe even have a neighborhood association that has their Beaverdale neighborhood sign has flowers around them. We proposed 15 years ago that we could buy a non-commercial, so a residential greenhouse, and we could grow 300 plus thousand annuals a year with one full-time employee how we were going to do it, we were going to use volunteers. And we were going to tell the council that this is a really affordable way to give that perception of Des Moines being a beautiful place. Once you're beautiful, everything else falls back into place. You've become to feel safe. You've become to feel warm, uh, welcoming. And not only did that work for 15 years, I'm proud to tell you that uh, this spring, we're actually going to open the first real greenhouse. And I say real because this will be commercially designed, commercially uh, constructed instead of a residential one. It'll be the first sustainability goal of our new sustainability plan. It'll be ran by 100% solar. It has a solar field right next to it. And the and the favorite part of the story is we're still going to operate with one full-time employee because we've been able for 15 years to get a lot of good volunteers to come in and give all this back. So all those flowers you see are mostly grown by volunteers from a seed to the plant. I bring up sports complexes because they're really economic engines here. These sports complexes host so many events. I don't know if you've ever had Greg Edwards here to talk about Catch Des Moines. He'd be a great speaker for you. But he, when I talk to Greg about these events that we work together to bring to Des Moines, it's an economic 
strategy. It's definitely not a money maker for the city. We we subsidize these facilities, but I can tell you, look at the math, 500 events last year. That is May, June, July, and August. Do the math. That's more than one a day, right? And so we host these events and we have tournaments, multiple tournaments that will take every hotel room in the entire metro, including Ames and Newton. And so when the downtown tourism industry calls, they say, please do more of these. We get it. They want to do more. When the restaurants get full, the hotels get full, and we just have a great time and people leave with a great, great view. And that's where another Mike Simon story kicks in here. Mike Simons and I work together. If you've ever been on Southeast 14th Street, you see those beautiful uh, iconic arches that tell you to go to the county. It's because people didn't know where they're going. And sometimes in Des Moines, that might not feel like the right way if you're not from Des Moines. Like, where am I going? So now we have these beautiful arches that are one off and people love it and they know where they're going to county soccer. Here's an example. We have lots of events. We've hosted every event you can think of there from the national soccer championships and the national rugby championships and the national archery championships just the last two years. But probably the most notable is our boys and girls high school championships here. So we have a moment of pride when we talk about bringing all the Des Moines, I mean, all the Iowa cities into Des Moines for these type of events. Okay, parks. We have 77 parks. This park system is over 125 years old. We have something for everyone. If we don't, let me know. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, we'll do anything. We'll try anything once. In fact, you're going to see on that list a climbing wall. Uh, try try to convince a bunch of city attorneys and a city risk manager you can put a free public climbing wall in the park. We did it. We did it. So so far, we're, we're in a good spot. We also have a SUTU wall, and I'm guaranteeing that most people here don't know what SUTU is, and I'll talk about that later. point is that when the community comes to us, we listen. Des Moines is made up of a lot of different cultures, and we want to make sure our park system reflects all the cultures and all the folks that use our park system. Trails. This community loves its trails. They have a fierce appetite. Uh, we have a fun little exercise during our budgeting time. We always ask people, if we gave you a fictitious $100 and you could break it down for us to help us make a recommendation to the city council, we have trails, we have parks, we have shelters, we have sports courts, and you know the list we were talking about here. No wrong answer. What would you do with that hundred dollars? They all, this is what blows my mind for over a decade. People will give ninety dollars to the trails and say, Ben, split the rest up at the prices. We just want more trails. So trails, we just put the full system into account trails. So if you see these little bollards you're walking by in Des Moines trails, it counts now very, very accurately. 3.2 million trail trips. If you just did the daily average, obviously winter is not going to be as much, but just if you broke that out by 365, almost 9,000 trail trips per year. This amount of trails per mile per thousand residents makes us the top five trail community in the nation right now. Enclosed shelters. I'll just draw your attention to the bottom left. That's a work progress administration shelter. We have about 10 of those in the park system. We're slowly, slowly budgeting and saving to build these back up. What we've done here is we've enclosed the openings in Florida, uh, Florida ceiling glass, added all heating and cooling in them, and you can see the numbers. If you don't want, if you want a Friday, Saturday, Sunday for May, June, and July or August, you've already been too late. We open registration the first week of January, and they sell out that quickly. If you're looking for a place to host a party, it's two hundred dollars for the day, a business meeting. I highly recommend you give these out a chance They're throughout the entire park system. Golf courses, I kind of hinted, we have a great, great story with golf. Uh, two of these courses, Bright Grandview and Waveland, are over 115 years old, making them both, the keyword public, oldest public golf courses this side of the Mississippi. If one thing in our business bottom line benefited from the pandemic, it was golf. Uh, people got to work from home, right? And so I would go out to our golf courses to check on them. And we'd only let you ride one per cart that first you know, six months because we were still learning about COVID. So I'd check on the golf courses. The passenger seat would have a laptop with a Zoom call going, and the other person was over here playing golf. It worked out for us. Uh, we have record rounds of golf. To give you a perspective, in the late 90s when golf had seen its real peak, before we started seeing not so much of a peak in golf, we'd be happy to get 90,000 rounds of golf. Now we're hitting 125,000, generating 5.2 million. That is one operation that makes its own way, that pays its own bills. So. Sometimes people have no idea that, that what falls under parks and recreation is also the zoo principal park in the Des Moines Botanical Gardens. So about 2008, uh, Matt McCoy and I worked on some deals with, the, with uh, the zoo and so did Jonathan Wilson here. We knew at 2008 when we had those bad budget years, how I started off with 147 full times. now we're down to 60, was we had to find a way to survive and had to find a way to keep these regional attractions going because they mean too much to this community. They're anchors here. 
So we, we developed these long-term operating agreements that would allow the zoo to get a cap of city investment, but also then create these new nonprofit boards that would raise a lot of money. And as you can see, if you've been to any of these facilities, they're all under a very similar model. They're all now thriving. They all now have capital campaigns. In fact, in the first couple of years, both the zoo and the botanical gardens actually raised additional $25 million outside of the city dollars. So think about that just for a minute. 25 million beyond what the city was ever going to give them in those first few years. And that keeps rolling now. Now into programs. We have a lot of programs. So first athletics, like you might guess, every parks and recreation department has a lot of athletics, but we really do have programs for all. Um, our oldest participants are in their eighties and our youngest are in pre key pre kindergarten. So, so one of my favorite things we've done in a long time, this is probably one of the things that we'll look back in my career and all of our careers and our team saying this is probably the most impactful thing. It may not sound like it while I'm describing it, but you'll see the end result. I've been going to city council meetings for 17 years, and I've watched over and over all the great economic development grants that roll through. So essentially, we're, sub we're subsidizing the investment for downtown or in our neighborhoods, and that's a good thing. We want to build our tax base, but we weren't subsidizing the future of our community, the kids. Right. There were so many kids. And if you have ever had anybody in your families that were able to play sports, you know, right now, youth sports is crazy expensive. So I went to the city council and I said, I think I have a really good idea that will help us develop this community in the future. Let's let's do something bold. Let's make all of our sports five dollars and the shock on their face at first. But then I explained, well, you, you're subsidizing all these great downtown businesses. Why can't we subsidize the future of the youth? And as you had those conversations, it started to roll. And let me give you a little bit of an analysis here. As I made this debate with a couple of city council members, we have 30,000 kids in Des Moines public schools-ish. During my career, any one time between 80 and 90% are on free and reduced lunch. So we're not a wealthy community, right? 80 to 9%. They cannot afford 50, 60, $70 to play a youth sport. They just can't. We were seeing it. Pre this program, six years ago, we had 300 kids playing basketball out of 30,000. That's embarrassing. That's not a good thing. You talk to the superintendents, they'll tell you that every kid that participates in an extra clicker activity has X amount more percentage to go on and be productive citizens, right? So after all this debate, I knew I, I needed two things. I needed Des Moines Public Schools to give me access to all their elementaries and all their middle schools. Because if I'm going to make this big, I only have two gyms. And they did. They said, here you go, free access. So we convinced the city council and in all the sports, but starting with basketball, it went from 300 in year one to 450 to 600 to 800. We have it going on right now at 1,200 kids. The Des Moines Athletic Director at all five high schools said thank you. For the first time, now it's year five, the freshmen are there. At North High, they couldn't field a ninth grade girls basketball team. Now they can. And that story goes through all five high schools, all the sports. So now we're doing this with all the sports. This program is going to make a big difference in our community. It may sound small, but we're going to keep kids on a great path. They're going to get a healthy alternative. They're going to have a safe place to be, and they're going to have good mentors. Do a lot of environmental education. So I look at all you, and I challenge you. We work with clubs. If you're ever looking for a team builder, we would love to get you all out to Gray's Lake on some stand-up paddle boards and see who can make it across the lake. Matt has volunteered with Mike already, so if you guys can get about eight more, we'll, we'll, we, we need about 10 of you to make it worth our time, but we'll, we'll knock it off for you some summer day. So put your team together. You can see we do a lot of things. We'd love to have you come out and see some of this. Special events, another thing. Uh, you, you hear a theme of you know knocking down bears, especially pay. I'll draw your attention just to our new movie screen. We bought that last year. It's a state-of-the-art digital movie screen. Like I said earlier today, it's $100 to take a family of four to the movie if you want to get a popcorn and a pop for everybody. And our community can't afford that. So we, we bought this machine with a grant from Prairie Meadows as well as a lot of fundraising. And we take this out to the neighborhoods. And we play movies in the parks. Started out with 300 people coming out, and they're very, very thankful, as you might guess and ended up with our last event with over 1,200 people. The demand for this movie screen next year is more than we have in the budget because we have to pay Hollywood for the royalty rights. So, But if you're out and you want to see our list, it's under our website under Free Flicks. Come out and have a free night in the movies with us and enjoy the park. Great uh, thing we have here, too. This is comes out of 2008 when we had those historic budget cuts. We knew right away that we needed a, a foundation, so we created the Friends of Des Moines Parks. In their first year, they created a program that makes sure every kid that couldn't afford swim lessons could afford swim lessons. They've carried that program since 2008 until this year. They've done over $100,000 in scholarships for swim lessons. You know, you pick up the paper, and it's sad anywhere you read a drowning, especially of a youth drowning. So that's one of their major goals. This group has seen so much success that in their first year, they raised $3,500 to do those swim lessons. Last week, we had their monthly board meeting. They have $4.5 million in their account.
They are raising money for trees, for playgrounds, for you name it, kids that can't afford. And they did a spinoff program. They were coming to our events to see that youth sports story. These kids are showing up without a sports ball, a basketball, a soccer ball, things they could do in their neighborhood to go play. So after two years, they've raised enough money to pass out over 4,000 sports balls to every kid, no matter if they're on free and reduced lunch or not. Every kid gets a sports ball now because of this group too. All right, so we had a lot of successes, you can see, as these last few years. And when this story comes together, every 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 city council member I've ever worked with and a city manager wants to know, okay, we've, we've added some new investment back. Where do we match up? Where do we benchmark with our community at? In my world, there's only really two agencies that can tell you that. The first is the Trust for Public Lands. It's a national nonprofit that does benchmarking for cities. They have two goals. One, they have a park score. They only rank the top 100 cities by population. Their other goal is making sure and having mayors take a pledge to make sure everybody has a 10-minute walk to a park. And that's based on about a six to seven block walk to a park, anywhere in. So I watched this come out for years and years and knew that we couldn't get in because we were about 104th largest city. We weren't the 100th largest city. And I really wanted to get in to see where we were at. I found out that they only had about 96 cities participating. And to me, it was easy. It was It's a lot of work to give them all the data they need. And I was finding out in my mind that there's probably three or four cities that didn't want to give all this work and say, hey, back to their city. Guess what? We're 97th and we're 98th. Yay, right? Well, we're too competitive. We wanted to know. So after pestering them for three years and telling them that their score can't truly be 100 if they have somebody that wants in, they let us in. And so the first year in 2019, we thought we'd be in the 80s or 90s. I mean, we come in and we're at 39th best park system. They liked engaging with us so much because we challenged them back. They let us stay in, even though we're not now about 107th largest city. But this year, uh, last year, we hit 21st best park city in the nation. That's based on a national metrics, no politics. How many basketball courts, how many miles of parks, uh, trails, how many parks do you provide per thousand residents? Beating cities like San Antonio, Philadelphia, Las Vegas. So we are the least funded department, but we're the 21st best parks and recreation system. So I'll tell you how we did that in a little bit too. Next is uh, when Ryan was nicely giving my intro. The other one is the National Recreation Park Association. As you can see, they also have a, a platform where you can apply to see how you perform and demonstrate your excellence in those four categories from long-range planning to physical sound business practices. And every year, there's only four categories, so there's four winners, and you're based on a population. So we're in that 150,000 to 400,000 category. And that's, again, we're about 212, so we're in the bottom side of that. Here we are again, out fighting our weight class. So after a number of years of trying, in 2022, we were we were became national champions. We were the best parks and recreation department in the entire nation in our category. So pretty exciting to say that all this stuff has come together. And, and it's because – next slide. Oh, sorry. And when, when you become nationally uh, recognized, you start bringing in national events. And that was one of my points here is those economics again. The Ironman wouldn't come here if we didn't have a top five trail system, and we weren't known as a city that rolled out the red carpet for these national events. Again, they filled every hotel – they filled all the restaurants up, and it's a great economic impact. It may, if you live along Fluor Drive, bother you a little bit when we close Fluor Drive down a lot, but it's really it's really impactful for the community's bottom line. So the trick to all this has been volunteers. Uh, in 2008, we hired our first ever volunteer coordinator. We, we knew we had two choices. We could live the death by a thousand cuts because we were down to 70 employees, or we could find a way to rebrand and rebuild and create that park foundation and then create this really impactful volunteer program. As you can see, from 2008 till 2023, we've grown it exp uh, exponentially. Just this year, we just had our volunteer awards. Over 6,000 unique volunteers gave us over 34,000 hours, which equivalent to about a million dollars in employee costs that we would have had if we could afford it. And where do they do? They do everything. Don't just think about the things that might come easy to mind, like do they break a fence line in a cemetery? Do they coach a youth sport? No, they do a lot more than that. They actually help us preserve historical records in our cemeteries. As you might guess, a lot of that's handwritten, so we try to scan all that in in case we have a fire someday. We know where everybody's interned at, all those good things. We also use them just to do just about everything we can think of. So I put this slide in. Maybe this is something you might be interested in. During the pandemic, we had more and more people that had more, more time to volunteer. So they came to us. We created an Adopt-A-Park or an Adopt-A-Segment of Trail program. And in, in return, we give a group that puts three to four events a year together. It's on their own, whatever they want to do. We put their name of their club up in the park or on that segment of trail, and they come out and they do three or four litter cleanups, for example. 
we make it extremely easy. We provide the bags, the gloves, the tools. For example, if it's just litter control, you tie that bag and leave it where you collected it at. We come and pick it all up. It's very easy, very professional. So if this club ever wanted to uh, get their name on a park or a trail, we'd love to have your name. All right, projects. So these are the big projects. We have a lot of capital dollars being invested. So a lot of people have been talking about ICON and water trails. So that's a different group, but we work together real closely. In my world, the, the, the hub of water trails will be Birdland Park. That's up there off of uh, by the rocket slide in Union Park or the carousel if you don't want a little bit of a landmark. That will be the hub of everything moving forward. Um, that's okay. We'll keep moving here. And then trails, right? So this is the biggest trail we'll build this year. It's actually under construction. This is the Karis Call, named after the two Ragbri founders. This connects people that live into Carlisle into the trail system. They have not been connected. So if you live in Carlisle, you can get on a bike trail in Carlisle at the end of the summer and go all the way to Jefferson, Iowa without getting off a trail. One of the challenges of our city is flooding. And so one of the things our city is working really hard on is putting in stormwater detention basins and key spots to help reduce flooding impacts of people's homes. I started looking at this program saying, well, you know, I imagine myself living here. What if the city came in and just put in this hole next to my neighborhood? Would it be very beautiful? Would I feel very proud? No, I wouldn't feel proud. So I went to the city manager and I went to the public uh, works department and they have a stormwater utility fee. I said, I think we can make lemonade out of lemons here by putting a park feature here together and working together. So what we did is we used our greenhouse staff and our horticulturists to design all the plant material that will go in this stormwater basin. It will have blooms that change colors throughout the season instead of just grass that may not look like a mosquito infested hole, right? We put a trail around it and we kept a little corner that was flat where we added a park feature. The neighborhood loved it. At first they were all up at arms against having this big, ugly looking hole next to their neighborhood. But this is unique ways where we can fill that 10 minute gap walk, what we want to do for that trust for public land. It helps us add more parks because we don't have to actually buy the land. We can come in with a little bit of money and add these features to it. So now what was an eyesore is something that the neighborhood's very proud of. Cohen Park, I talked to you about, you know, our risk manager. There's the boulder wall we put in. This is where we listen. When people come to us, we go to the neighborhoods. We, we bring uh, language interpreters. We listen to whatever they want. They get to pick what goes into their neighborhood within the budget. That's our climbing wall. And then this back corner by the basketball court, it looks like a little tic-tac-toe. It's called Sutu. It's a new Latino game. We're the first in Iowa to have it. There's only four in the nation right now. They're, they're really popular in Europe. You kick a soccer ball against that. You can play a lot of games. It'll tell you how fast you kick. It'll give you a radar gun. You can play four corners. You can play like bingo type games across the middle. If your friend has a uh, that lives in Europe, you have a colleague or friend that's in there, you can play at the same time on an app. So one of the challenges is to get these kids unplugged. One way to trick them to be unplugged is coming out and still being plugged in a little bit, but playing on an app. So we're trying new things. Probably our most noteworthy uh, project is our newest rec center we're going to build. It'll give us our third rec center. Today, it's the YMCA's Grub YMCA. City has always owned the building. They have leased it and operated it. It's at a time now where it can't be really fixed. It's over 140 years old. Uh, did you all know that it was a church and it was Dowling, It was originally Dowling High School? Anybody know that? Yep. So folks might have known that. So now we've worked with the community. We've listened. We're going to build a brand new state-of-the-art, energy-efficient recreation center in the green box in the lower left here. And that way we can keep the old building currently open and while we build a new one, and then we'll lay down the old building and build our parking lot. That way our neighbor does not have to have any lapse in service. Another great fundraising story, the city was able to put $12 million into this. The county was a big player in this and well. We raised $6 million to join the $12 million, so we'll have an $18 million brand new rec center in a part of our community that hasn't seen great investment. So again, here we are proving that we're putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to equity. There's some cool renderings of what it's going to look like here in the park features. Here's another equity project. This is a fun story from last summer. So if you know where Evelyn K. Davis Park is, it's north of Drake and a little bit east. It's a historically used park. I'd say it's probably a top five used park in our park system, which includes Gray's Lake. It sees a tremendous amount of use. They love basketball courts. They had a single basketball court there before this project. We came in with some of the sales tax money you might remember from a few years back. We added a second basketball court. We added lights on their request. This is not a city-sanctioned event. Usually we do dedication. This is the day we open. They hosted their own celebration. They had break dancing between games. They did a fundraiser. Every kid at every sport, well, sorry, every basketball program at each of the five high schools, boys and girls, each got $1,000 of the proceeds for their programs because of them. They did it all on their own. This goes to show that if you embrace a neighborhood, you work together, they'll have pride in what you give them, and they'll want to make sure that that's pride for their community. 
another idea that I brought for you is playgrounds. We build three playgrounds a year. Five years ago, I started looking at the bottom line as prices is starting to go through the roof. Playgrounds are not cheap. Uh, a small playground is a hundred thousand dollars, and most of that thirty to forty percent of that per vendor is about the cost of installation. So. What we've been doing is we have a couple of city employees that know how to put these together. We find clubs and corporations that come and help us for eight hours. It's all it takes. Sometimes it's less than that to put them together. That way I can buy them a bigger playground for their neighbor that will last them a lot longer. So we have a fun event. If you ever wanted to build a playground, I'm telling you, it's nothing more rewarding than watching little kids come up to you the whole day saying, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Can I jump on it? So uh, again, we make it real easy. We bring a lot of city employees that do the heavy lifting. We just have you guys turn the bolts and hold things and put it together. It takes less than an hour. So if you have interest, Make sure you hit me up. We'd love to have you help build a playground. Riverview Park, a uh, little historical celebration here. I don't know. And raise your hand if you were ever at Riverview before it was Riverview. Yes. One of my favorite projects to this day. We got to work again. Matt was instrumental. He put a lot of money from the county in this, so thank you. Uh, this is my favorite project. When I was out doing the public meetings before we built the park, you heard stories like, this is where I met my first wife. <laughs> this is where I had my first kiss. I heard stories I won't tell you. Uh, there's a lot of things you heard about just the people's personal connections to this. So we purposely work with Variety who donated a $750,000 playground. It's one off. You can't buy it anywhere else. It's mim it's made to mimic all the rides that were there. So if you look at the playground, it'll say Wild Mouse because the Wild Mouse was the roller coaster that was there. It's really, really neat. There's a historical panel uh, in the, as you walk through there, and it has pictures of the uh, alleged event when Elvis Presley came at about midnight and shut the lights off so they could bring him in and his band when he was at uh, Vets Auditorium. You have to check it out. But this project is really a great story because you know, you're know you always the victim of your success sometimes. When we built Gray's Lake, the rest of the city wanted one Gray Lake in their corner, right? Everybody wants their own Gray's Lake. They said, when do we get our Gray's Lake? So now... They call this their Gray's Lake, and they're so proud of this, and they host a lot of events here. Even North High had their graduation ceremonies there this year, so we're loving seeing people use these parks for different things. Everybody know the rocket slide? Uh, purchased in like 1972 for $6,200, and at the next council meeting, we'll probably have a contract. Hopefully, it gets approved for a lot more than $6,200. So actually, it's six figures. And so there's only three of these left in the nation that are in a public space. And so this is going to get totally refurbished to give it another 50 years on life. If you know the history, it's before my time. But in 1990, the manufacturer has to provide all the safety guidelines for playground equipment. And as long as the city maintains it, your liability is zero. They sent a letter to the city and said, we can't keep up with, we can't make replacement parts. It's just too old. So the city was going to tear it down. If you Google this in the register, you'll see that people came out short of tying themselves to the slide. They stayed there with kids and it was saved. The unions came together, the metal fabric unions, they saved it. And so no, no city council person wants to tear it down. I'm telling you that right now. So we're going to save it again and it's going to get fixed. All right. That's a lot. So if you, if you don't have social media, you don't really exist, right? So please follow us on social media. We always give a lot of information, whatever program's coming up next, whatever parks project we're working on, you can find all of it there. With that, I went quickly in case you had questions. I have been consistently impressed with the creativity and innovation of the parks department. Uh, I, I will say, I feel like the parks department might be unique in that reputation in the city. Um, I'm curious uh, how you, A, generate some of your creative and innovative ideas, and B, uh, get the rest of the uh, departments and city council to go along with them. Is this like creative ideas that you sort of get in-house, or are you see really copying all these other cool cities that I just don't know about, or what's the, how do you make it happen? It's a great question. So uh, a long time ago, one of my mentors is Terry Rich. He used to run the zoo, run the state lottery. If you've ever met Terry Rich, he's a really passionate guy when it comes to creativity. So he came and spoke to us 15 years ago. And I still remember it. He created this system called COT, Consider or Trash. And essentially the bottom line was never say no to a good idea, even if you don't have the bandwidth or the resources to work on it. So we've embraced that as a team and we keep, I have a subfile on my email of all the COTs and we have way more than we can get to, but we try each year through the budgeting process to have a process where the entire team, all 60 get to come together and help us prioritize and make a list. It's not me just picking them. It's everybody's work coming together. And so it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of keeping a national pulse. Uh, I just joined the National Recreation Park Association board and we had just had a meeting yesterday. So I'm always trying to see what's out there. I want to keep us as on the top of that national performing list. I mean, it's harder to cut a department that's doing really good things and being national, uh, you recognize and using all those volunteers. And when you come from a 
period of time as a city department leader, when you saw the worst of the worst, your, your people that you really love working with lose their jobs because of bad budgets, you'll do anything it takes to make sure that doesn't ever happen again. And that's our strategy. Uh, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, two things. I have a dear friend that um, it's a simple way to help support the park. But when you go for a walk and use the trails, take a plastic bag with you. Scoop over and pick something up. I have a friend of mine that's adopted McCray Park. Yes. And every morning on his morning walk, he takes bags and picks up trash. And in the spring, he ends up taking big bags. Yes. And now his his pride and joy is to show you off McCray Park and how he keeps it clean. Uh, I love this it. Is, this is not an or you know, this isn't organized. This isn't through a volunteer program. It's just a simple thing that each and every individual can do. One last thing. One thing I would really love to see more of as an older person who can no longer walk very much. I miss having round trail, you know, Gray's Lake. As my ability to walk decreased, I realized the first bench was halfway around Gray's Lake. Mm -hmm. And although there are picnic tables, in the morning, if you're an early walker, you have to walk across wet grass to sit down, and then you get a wet bottom. Yes. <laughs> so uh, maybe some more benches around sure. walking areas, especially for uh, those of us who are not as um, able to uh, get around a, a, a long trail. Call that chronologically gifted, right? And so we're going to, we'll take that back and we'll make sure we can do that. Benches are easy to add and we, we are really working about accessibility. I'll give you an idea. At Gray's Lake, we just added the first charging station for powered wheelchairs because sometimes the battery might be dying when you don't want it to die. So you can quickly charge it and that way you can keep on the trail system. So great comment. I'll take that back to the team. One of the things in my neighborhood that I'm excited about is a new trolley. Um, to, is, is that the... Is that under your guidance too? So, because I think historical mm -hmm. places are really important too. It's right in front of Waveland Golf Course. That's it's right. on park property. Uh, a lot of these deals we bring to the city are a hybrid. They're really a little bit of city resource and a lot of neighborhoods working together. So it is yes to the answer, but also I want to make sure the Waveland Neighborhood Association gets the credit they deserve because they raise the money and they're doing the minor maintenance, like they'll weed the flower beds and keep them watered and all that good stuff. So yes, another way we can leverage more investment to see greater impact on our community. So. Great project before, but I would come back in a heartbeat. You guys are fun.